Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now, the next verse, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 10, we ran, went over last week. He said, Not, also, don't let us act immorally, as some of them did. Then that day, 23,000 fell. That's in Numbers. You can read about that in chapter 25. It's actually better to start in chapter 21 and go to 25, so you get the whole backstory with Balaam and Balak. And <laughs> it's sad, but we went over that one enough. Then he says, don't let us also try the Lord, as some of them did. And they were destroyed by serpents. Now, what did they do to try the Lord? We went over this last week. They began to grumble and complain. Why'd you bring us out here? There's no, you know. And why do we have to follow that guy? And they're pointing at poor Moses. And why does Aaron get to be the leader, you know, the priest? Why does he get to be the special guy? And, and, and the Lord went, all right, Moses, make us... Make a bronze serpent, put it on top of your staff. I'll fix the grumblers. The co- I wish you'd do this today. I could get a stick. I, I actually learned in art class how to cast bronze. I could make a little serpent. But see, I need him to, to reinforce this, to go send in the snakes. You guys know the story, right? The snakes, every time they grumbled and complained, they got bit. And then they only had a couple minutes till it was over. They had one choice. What was it? Look at the snake, the bronze snake, on top of the staff of, uh, of Aaron. Uh, I mean, sorry, of Moses. And so he's, he says, look at this. Now, they didn't, want, they didn't want Moses to be in charge, so they don't like this whole thing because the guy who has the stick that can save him, don't you like God's sense of humor? <laughs> I do. I mean, I was thinking, this is pretty good. They're mad that he's the leader, and God goes, I'll fix it. I'll get down to the real heart of the issue. I'll let them get bit because they're complaining about Moses. And then I'll tell them, if you want to live, you got to look at who? At Moses, holding the stick. Well, I don't want to look at Moses. I don't like Moses. I don't even like that he's the leader. They were really mad. Amazing to me that they grumbled. And the scripture tells us Numbers 21, that they were destroyed. Because there were, there were some, it says, that we just read in Exodus, they are an obstinate, obstinate, stiff-necked people. They're like, I'm not going to look. Moses right over there, I'm not going to look. <laughs> look, buddy, you got like less than three minutes before the neurotoxins and you ain't going to be able to look. You should turn your head now. No. I mean, I can just see them. They're so stubborn. Have you ever met someone that stubborn? Man, and it cost them. They died. Now, the next story, this is the one I want to finish with today. It's the part found here. It says in uh, verse 10, Nor let us grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, when did they grumble? Well, a lot of times, yeah. Yeah. There's one particular grumbling story that, that's found in number 16. And I think this is probably the best one for um, bringing out the, the point what Paul is making, to be careful that we don't become like these guys. Because, and this is one that really kind of, I'm a, as a pastor, this one kind of is too close to the heart. This one stings a little. Because this one involves Aaron, the same guy that did the golden calf thing. A little while later, some of the other leaders in, in, the, in the nation of Israel, the Levites, are, they're, they're already chosen by God to be his priests, you know, as a, as a tribe. They're to be the representatives to go, and by, they take, by lot, they take up the, um, the chance to go and make the offering before the Lord on the table of showbread, to do the lighting of the candle, you know, inside the menorah, keep it burning, do all that. They, they are already, 
how do I say this? They're already in full-time ministry, we would say. They're already ministers unto the Lord. But if you can, if you can really pay attention to the details of the story, you'll notice that even ministers, ministers, that are already ministers of the Lord, can be jealous of another guy who's a minister of the Lord. Maybe he just has a different ministry. Maybe has a calling from God to do a specific part of the ministry. And men, what this tells me is men have not changed. Because these guys are going to get so petty. And yet I have seen the same thing reoccur today that happened in this story back then. Let me show you this story. This is the story of Korah. Now some of you might already know about this story. In Numbers chapter 16 it says, Now Korah the son of Isthar, the son of Cawthon, the son of Levi. Okay, so he's a Levite, just so you know. He's one of the chosen ones for the... the uh, it says, along with Dathan and Abram, the son of I Elia, and On and Peleth, the son of Reuben. These guys, these three took action. And they rose up before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel. 250 leaders, not 250 Joshmos. 250 leaders of the congregation. Men, it says, chosen in the assembly. Men of renown. These are the, we would say these are, pro they got 250 prominent leaders amongst the children of Israel. And these three fellows, they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to, to Moses and Aaron, you have gone far enough. For the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Why are you doing this, that you're, you're exalting yourself? Now, when Moses heard this, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, said, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and, and, and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. So do this, he says. Take censers for yourselves, fire pans in the King James, it says, and, and, and Korah and all your co company, and put fire in them, and lay incense upon them in, in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. He says, for you, Moses says, have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. And then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi, if it is not enough for you that God, the God of Israel, has already separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service of the tabernacle to the Lord, to, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them. You're already ministers for God. You get to come to his to his tabernacle. You get to stand before the people as a representative for the Lord. If that's not enough for you, he says, that, and, and that the Lord has brought you near Korah and all your brothers and sons of Levi with you, and you are seeking for what? For the priesthood also? You want Aaron's job now? You know, there was only one high priest. But they don't like that God chose Aaron. Yeah, we're ministers too, but how come he gets to be the high priest? Like, we're just as good. We should be high priests with him. Maybe we should take over. Why does, why does he get the job? Well, wait a minute. How come Aaron got the job in the first place? Do you guys remember this story? Moses got the calling from God for him to be the instrument God was going to use to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage to Egypt. Except Moses had a stuttering problem. I don't know if you know this. It says in the scripture he was slow of tongue. That's old lingo for da 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 you know. He couldn't talk. He was a stutterer. And so he said, God, I don't want to do it. I can't even speak right. The Lord went, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll speak to you. Then you will speak I'll be God to you, and you'll be like God to Aaron. You'll tell, in other words, you pass the message to your kin, Aaron, and Aaron will give the message to the people. God didn't even accept Moses' resignation. I mean, Moses was trying to get out of the job. I don't know if you read that in the scripture, but isn't it true? He didn't really want to do this. He's like, can I get out of this? 
And Aaron, poor Aaron, he didn't actually ask or campaign for the job. His stupid cousin got him into it. I mean, basically, it was like Moses got him into trouble, and he's like, now you get to be the high priest. Oh, great. And now, and he's already messed up. I mean, we know because we just read one of his mess-ups, you know, with the ring thing and the fire and the, woo, wow, golden calf. And he's not a perfect guy. But now he's being attacked. Him and Moses are being attacked by, the, by 250 prominent leaders plus these three guys. And they're, and they're saying, we should be the high priest. Almost like you're already in the priesthood and you're just... Do men ever get petty like this? When there's another man God chooses for a special thing and they're not the one? Why aren't I the one? I should be the one. You know, men are like this. You girls probably already know, but a few guys pay attention. And so, therefore it says, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble. Here's your, here's your grumbling, verse 11. Sorry, it took me so long to get there. Who is Aaron that you grumble against him? Then Moses sent, and he summoned Dathan and Abiram and, and the sons of Elia, but they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us up out of a land? A land, it says, I'll listen to this. A land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness? What? You talk about twisting the story around. Wasn't God delivering them from Egypt to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey? And they're talking about the place they came from, Egypt. You brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey to bring us to a desert to die. Talk about twi These guys are twisted. They got weird thinking. But, but, and on top of it, you want a Lord over us? Indeed, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields with vineyards. Would you put out, our eye, the, out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. You're going to just punish us. Moses became very angry. He said to the Lord, Do not regard their offering. I haven't taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. And Moses said to Korah, You and all your company be present before the Lord tomorrow, both you along with Aaron. And each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 fire pans, and you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. And so they each took their own censer, put fire on it, laid incense on it, and stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And thus Korah assembled all the congregation. These guys didn't just do a 250-man revolt. 253, the three guys. They got the whole congregation in on the deal. You talk about pressure. How come Aaron gets to be the guy in front? Now the whole congregation is there. And it says, And the glory of the Lord appeared to, the to the, all the congregation. And then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, Separate yourself from amongst this congregation, that I might consume them instantly. But they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Lord, didn't you say, <laughs> I can just see Moses, did you say the guy who does it is going to get in trouble? Now you want to wipe them all out? They're just getting sucked in by these guys. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the congregation, get back. Get back from around the dwellings of Korah and Dathan and Abram. You better get away from these three guys. Then Moses arose. He went to Dathan and Abram with the elders of Israel following him. He spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them or you will be swept away in all their sin. So they got back from around the dwellings of Korah and Dathan and Abram. And Dathan and Abram came out and stood at the doorway of their tents, along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, and that this is not my doing. This is how you'll know. Look at verse 29. If these men die the death of all men, if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord did not send me. 
But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs and they descend alive into Shoal, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. Uh, anyone want to volunteer to be Moses for this day? I mean, have you ever thought about, as a leader, you know, I always try to see what the leaders in the Bible had to do. This would have been a quite challenging day. How do you know you really got chose to do your job? Well, let's just make sure that we know that it was God that chose me and not men, and let's make sure that you know it was God that chose me, and just to make sure that you know if you die like an ordinary death of any ordinary man, then God didn't choose me. But if the ground opens up and swallows you alive down to shoal and closes up over you, then God sent me. Oh! I don't want to be Moses this day. I mean, what happens if nothing happens? I mean, you guys cheated, didn't you? You know what's happening. Nobody looks scared. You already know what's going to happen, don't you? Very next verse, look at that. Number 16, verse 31. And as he finished speaking these words, the ground that was under them split open. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their, all their household with them and all the, the men who belonged to Korah and their possessions so that they all... All that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. You told, they never show this in the movies. This would be good. Spielberg could do a good job with this. I can just see the special like the earth opens, the fire's coming out, you know, they get sucked down in there. Then it closes over them. You can just see the pan in as they're looking up. And the earth just... See ya. And all Israel who are around, <laughs> I love this, verse 34, they fled at their outcry. They said, the earth's going to swallow us up too. Ah, run, you know. And fire also came forth from the Lord. Fire also came forth and consumed the 250 men who were offering their incense. Now, three guys that started the rebellion, they get swallowed alive with their whole household, everything they own, down straight to Shoal. But the 250 men, the Lord sends fire and zots them. And listen to this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, say, say to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blaze, for they are holy. And you are to... Uh, and you scatter the burning coals abroad. As for the censors of those men that have sinned at the cost of their own lives, let them be hammered into sheets for plating of the altar. Since they did present them before the Lord, they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the sons of Israel. What kind of sign does this make? Here's a sign for you guys that the altar is going to be plated with what? The bronze plating that was taken from the 250 fire pans, Eleazar, pound those into plating and put them on the altar. And everyone goes, what's that plating on the altar about? Oh, that was when the 250 guys decided they wanted Aaron's job. God didn't really, ex he, he, he resigned them. <laughs> Accepted their fire pans as resignation offerings. Here you go, you're out of here. And he took them out. And so they did. They, they pounded them into the plating and, he, and put them on, a, on the altar, verse 40, as a reminder to the sons of Israel that no layman who is not a descent of Aaron should come near to burn the incense before the Lord. And so that he will not become like Korah and his company, just as the Lord had spoken to him through Moses. But on the next day, oh no. I don't know if you read any further in this chapter. Just like extra credit for tonight, you can read this. The next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, you are the ones that caused the death of the Lord's people. Nothing like being a leader for the Lord. You get blamed for everything. I mean, seriously, you might as well, if you want, anyone here want to be a servant leader for the Lord? Get ready to get blamed 
First, they ain't going to like you for that you got chosen by God to do it. And then they're going to blame you when anything goes wrong. Even though, who's, who led the rebellion? Moses and Aaron? No, they were the guys that were being rebelled against. But now, just one day is all it took. One day for the whole public opinion to shift. And whose fault is it? According to the people, the congregation. It's your fault, Moses and Aaron. You caused the death of the Lord's people. It came about, however, that the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron. They turned it towards the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And then Moses and Aaron came out from the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses. You're going to probably guess what he's going to say. Get away from them, this congregation, that I might consume them instantly. <laughs> and you know what kills me? Moses and Aaron fall on their faces, and they take the, they, they take the censer from, their, from Aaron's censer, they put fire on the altar, they lay incense on it, and they bring it quickly amongst the congregation to make atonement for them. For the wrath of the Lord had gone forth, and a plague had begun. And then Aaron took Moses, it says, it took it as Moses, it, it, it says, had, uh, had spoken, and he ran into the midst of the assembly, for behold, the plague had begun amongst the people. And so he put the incense on each of the people to make atonement for them, and he took his stand between the dead and the living so that the plague was checked. But those that died by the plague were 14,700, besides those that had died on account of Korah the day before. And then Aaron returned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meeting, for the plague had been checked. Now this just kills me. They still are going to argue over who's going to, why does he get to be the leader? And the Lord's going to tell them in chapter 17, all right, everybody, let's, um, I'm going to show you how God makes the choice. Get me some almond sticks. You know, cut off a stick, one for each tribe, put your name on it. You guys read that story, right? Extra credit tonight. You can read number 17. And what happened when they put the, the, the sticks there? It says they deposited them in the, in, the, in the tent of testimony before the Lord. And the next day, verse 8 says, when they went in the, the rod, that little, that little stick, almond stick, that was from, that, from Aaron for the house of Levi, it had sprouted. Just the stick had sprouted and put forth buds, and produced blossoms, and bore ripe almonds. Now that happens overnight all the time. Even when the stick is attached to the tree, right? That's how fast almonds come. No. <laughs> Yet the Lord went, okay, the one that I make fruitful is the one that's my choice. Aaron's rod, his little carved rod, his is the one that made the almonds by the next day. Lord goes, that's my choice. Shut up. I mean, I, he didn't say that. I said that. I'm just paraphrasing. I mean, it was like they just didn't quit. It's like they just had a plague that killed 14,700 of them. And only because Aaron, the high priest, took his stand as a priest would for the people and ran around putting the incense on, saying, that, you know, remember the incense like prayers offered to God. Prayer for this person. Pray for them. Spare them. Spare them. Spare them. He's running around sparing them, and he still can't get to 14,700. That's a lot of folks that died because they complained. Now, sometimes I think, is it, you know, some people that, that's terrible. But if you've ever had just one complainer in your midst, have you ever worked on a job where you had one person that they just complain about everything? And then it, 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 a weird thing happens. It, it kind of gets contagious. They keep complaining until it kind of rubs off on the other guy, and now you got two complainers. And what happens if you leave them alone? They multiply. I mean, I don't know why, but there's just this weird phenomena, and pretty soon you've got a whole bunch of complainers. I kind of wish, don't get mad at me, but I'm just saying, in church experience that I've gone through over the last 35 years, I kind of wish the first one, as soon as he started complaining, zotsum. 
Just saying. Stop him quick before it spreads. Because didn't it just say Paul was saying, let us learn from these guys. Let's take heed that we don't let the evil. I mean, he's, he's warning. Don't look at this. Verse 6. These happen for us as examples so we would not crave evil things as they crave. You know, even craving some other man's calling. If God called that guy to do it, don't, don't be trying to get his calling. God put him there. And if you really study, you might find out the guy didn't even want to be there, but he's still there because God called him. It's up to God. But if God calls someone to do something, leave room for God to use them where he's called them and don't try to go take his calling. And don't grumble, well, I could do a better job. When people say that about me, I'm thinking, you probably could. <laughs> and if you would, I wouldn't have to be doing this, but no. Now, see, they always want to come do it for you once it's all done. You wouldn't believe how many people are willing to come and take over this church in Hawaii for me now. <laughs> now that we have a church and it's all going and the, you know, they didn't want to come here 15 years ago when this, this part of the park was a dump and it was closed for two years because of hepatitis and staph infections. Because of all the rubbish and the human waste down here that smelt like an outhouse. They, they didn't want to come and help me do it then. They didn't want to come 10 years earlier than that when there was no church here that when, when, when we came and planted the work here. They didn't want to do that. That's, oh, those are tough times. You've got to trust God every day. You've got to, get, you've got to start with nothing and, and, and you've got to be faithful and see God work and make, you know, bring together a flock and give you people to, to care for and love. And it's funny. Once you get a couple folks coming and it's all going good, lots of volunteers to take over. But if God didn't call them to do it, it's funny how some of those very guys will show up and start to complain and grumble against me. Why don't you get the job? Back to the beginning of the message. God chose the what things of the world? The foolish. To confound the wise. There's my credentials. Don't ever go, oh, our pastor's so great. No, no, he's a fool. He would do this job. This is a foolish job. This, you don't get paid enough for the hours you do this job. There isn't enough pay to put up with some of the garbage that you go through doing this job. I'm just saying, if it's not your calling, run. Don't even aspire to this. This is a terrible job. My son said to me, Dad, I hope you don't mind. I don't really feel called to be a pastor. My son Daniel. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Son, this is not for everyone. I, 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 honestly, it isn't. This is a hard calling. And, and you know, if your disposition isn't wired for it, this calling will bite you, chew you, and spit you right back out. This is not for the faint of heart. Because I, I had people tell me, don't go to Hawaii. Don't. It's a tough place to share the gospel. People there, they don't have... They feel like we don't need anything. We have everything. We live in paradise. Why do I need to why do I need a savior to go to paradise? I'm already in paradise. Hard to convince a rich man that he has a need. Do you guys know that we all need a savior? It's a need. You need a savior to save your soul because you have sin. All of us have sinned. We all need a savior. But some people go. They can't identify. When they have no other needs, they're physically so well taken care of, they're like, I can't even identify. You go to a poor country and preach that you need a Savior, just like you need bread and water to live, and they go, sign me up. Because they understand having a need. Someone who doesn't have a need. It, Jesus said it is harder to, to, to see a rich man come into the kingdom of God than to get a camel to go through that what? The eye of a needle. It's difficult. The rich guys don't really want to hear the gospel. And then God goes, that's okay. There might be some rich guys in Hawaii, but i got a lot of poor guys there too. I'm going to send you to help some of them. And I feel so blessed, guys, that this little body gets to help a lot of the less fortunate in our community. It's a, it's a Because their ear is a little more open to hear. 
about their need for a Savior. And that's what we're here for, the souls. Don't ever lose sight of that. We're just here to reach people with the good news, what Jesus did. It's wonderful. And we're grateful, I'm grateful, we have warnings. I mean, these warnings are pretty, pretty intense once you study all the stories. Don't crave after gold. Don't crave after meat. Don't crave after immorality. Don't crave after, you know, lustful sin. Don't, don't crave after some other man's calling or position. Don't try the Lord. Don't grumble. These are all things that happen to them for our example. So we could learn from it. So we wouldn't have to pay the price for craving something we should not crave. So what should we crave? Blessed are those that crave or hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Righteousness means right standing with God. Not self-righteousness. The righteousness that, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. But the righteousness of Christ that he made for you. He, he made it so you could stand in right standing with God, your sins forgiven. That's true righteousness. Not based on us, based on him. Righteousness in Christ. Seek that. Hunger and thirst to be right with God, and then it says you'll be satisfied. You get a, you get a fulfillment that the world cannot give. When, when, when you know that you are right with God, and you know it in your heart. You know, I got it right with him. I'm, I'm standing in what his son did. There is such a peace that comes over you. There's such a contentment for this life in, in the f sense of, you know, I know this isn't permanent and God has greater things that lie ahead. And it helps you put things in perspective that you have to face down here. It's sweet to live in that righteousness because when you hunger for that, Jesus says, then you'll be filled. That's when you're going to get really true contentment. But if you hunger and thirst after any of these other things that they did, is, does it end in fulfillment? No, it ends in death. And that's why he says, take heed, lest you think you stand. Some guys say, oh, I can seek after gold, pastor. It's not going to hurt me not going to take me away from being a Christian. How many guys have you seen that used to serve the Lord, but now they're, they've, 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 their eyes have turned? They're all about the money. It's all, it, it used to be they were about the Lord, but it changed. And by the way, can that happen to ministers? Sure. And unfortunately, they're the guys up front, so everyone always points to them. Like they're the only ones that happens to. Guys, I got news for you. The congregation does the same sinning all the time. They just don't stand in front so people don't point it out as much. Oh, but they do point it out. You can't get away with anything. There's always some non-Christian watching you. Oh, and then there's those Christians too. And they're going to say, D oh, did you know she's a Christian and she did that? Oh, They delight in doing that. Let's don't give them the chance. Let's do it right. Just keep your eyes on the Lord this week. Learn from their examples so you don't wind up getting caught, tripping up in something. I mean, that's why the warnings are there, right? Warning, slow down, caution, danger, immorality ahead, danger, false gods ahead, danger, going after money ahead, danger. You know, these are going after someone else's calling. That's a danger. Maybe you didn't recognize that one, but it costs Cora. It cost those three guys their lives. It didn't just cost them their lives. It cost their whole family. And all their servants all sucked down the shoal. That's heavy. That makes me say, don't go after another man's ministry. You want a ministry? Say, God, can I have one like that? Not that guy's. Like that guy's. Like, build, you know, let God use you to build that, and then you'll have one like it. You don't have to, you don't have, to have his calling. Believe me, us ministers would love it if we had more ministers going after more of the souls here. When I got here 25 years ago, I was blown away. The pastors from other churches, this guy from Hope Chapel, Pastor Sonny Shimoka, and, and, and Pastor David Reese Thomas, and 
this other guy, Greg Kirschman from Halualoa Chapel, they came and they said, how can we help you? And I went, what? I came from an area in Arizona where the churches were like, we're in this camp and you're in that camp. And neither the twain show me, except the Amy Grant concert. But, you know, I mean, we were like, everyone just stay in your own camp. And here, I get here and they're like, we are outnumbered. There's not very many Bible-believing churches. Welcome to the community. How can we help? And they literally helped me. I'm like, well, I need to get one of those overhead projectors to put the words, you know, the acetate thing. I got the acetates, but I don't have the thing to project it on the wall. They went together, their three churches, and bought me an overhead projector and brought it to me and said, here, welcome to the community. May the Lord bless you. I was like, wow. Believe me, ministers do want more guys to minister and reach the, reach the ones that are, are out there. We're not going, don't do that. We want that. We just don't want guys to come and try to take our ministry that God called us to because we know that there's a big danger in that. You know, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Don't do that. Don't ever try to take another man's ministry. You, you have to let God call you to the ministry you're called to do. And that's when it's safe. That's when it's good. So let's close. Father, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to sit and proclaim your gospel these 25 plus years here in Kona. I just pray that you would continue to bring more laborers. You said to pray for more laborers in the harvest, Lord. You said, look up. The fields are white for harvest. There's so many souls that need you. So we pray you would bring the right laborers to our community to our islands, Lord, throughout the whole of the islands, this would become a place known as the place where people meet with you, their maker. They come here to get close to, to their heavenly Father. And Father, we ask that you would do that. You would pour out great revival in the islands. Pray that for all of the other fellowships up and down, round about our coast, Lord, that you would just let each fellowship be used in a mighty way to to help folks grow closer to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people that agreed said, Amen. 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 May you go in the peace of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com Mahalo and God bless.